Should I start again, given the recording? Yeah. I don't think I've said anything too important. Um, so, um, so yeah, this 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 physics invites comparison with these uh, with quantum field theory, and and there's a question then as to how much what we know from quantum field theory we should be importing uh, into trying to understand the the Hilbert space of quantum gravity, if you like. Um, and in particular, for example, the Hilbert space of these baby universes that I'll be um, discussing, and um, or whether that kind of comparison is going to, to lead us astray. So that motivated us in this work to, to think about some of the, the formalism we've been developing recently to, to think about baby universes in this context and apply it to these one-dimensional theories of gravity and compare uh, what we get from sort of gravitational considerations with what we might expect from quantum field theory. Uh, and so one particular question that, um, that's been brought up is um, is this question that, uh, of the abelian algebra observable. So one of the crucial elements of this is the idea that we have this sort of ensemble duality, which involves just a classical probability distribution over different theories. And that classical probability distribution comes from the fact that the algebra of asymptotic observables is abelian, that, that you can think of different boundaries as being commuting operators in an appropriate sense, which we'll talk about. Uh, but that is obviously not what we usually think about when we talk about quantum field theory, where we have a non-abelian algebra of, uh, of fields. And so that, that in particular is asking, uh, it sort of maybe throws a bit of doubt uh, onto, onto this idea of, of this abelian algebra and, and raises a question as to uh, whether we're describing the right physics. Okay, um, so I'm going to start off with uh, a sort of review. Um, probably a lot of this talk will be uh, will be just getting the background in place before we can start putting it to work in these one-dimensional theories. Um, so I'm going to review uh, a recipe uh, for building a Hilbert space of baby universes. So the idea here is that uh, is that well, okay. I think we'll just. Um, yeah, so this is a way of thinking about theories of, of quantum gravity. Uh, and there are certain ingredients, things you need to specify to define your theory. And then with those ingredients defining your theory, you can, you can cook up a, a Hilbert space, uh, construct a Hilbert space out of those ingredients. And perhaps one of the main purposes of today's talk is to make it very explicit what those ingredients are, uh, what the choices are that go into it and how the choices might differ between quantum field theory and what we normally want to uh, describe for quantum gravity. Um, so the next few slides will be sort of unpacking this, this list. Um, so maybe we'll just, um, rather than going through all these here, we'll, um, we'll uh, kind of dive into the first, uh, the first couple of ingredients. Um, so first of all, if we want to, um, describe a theory of quantum gravity, we have to ask what it is we want to compute. And um, I'm going to be sort of explaining things or thinking about these things in a, a path integral uh, formalism. Uh, so um, the first thing we should specify is, is what boundary conditions we uh, allow for our, our path integral. And these boundary conditions will be, uh, will be telling us or well, we're computing some expectation values of observables and so forth. And this could be almost anything. So we could be thinking about sort of uh, Euclidean boundary conditions for Euclidean space times or some Lorentzian boundary conditions. It could have different asymptotics, whether it's some ADS, ADS asymptotics like we used to in, uh, in ADS CFT or flat asymptotics, like you might be computing some S matrix of, of graviton scattering or something, or perhaps de Sitter asymptotics we want to describe uh, the, uh, the CMB at the end of inflation or something. Uh, and these boundary conditions could be for the metric and other fields we have in, in our theory, or it could even be a theory which has strings or something else. So this is really um, encompasses quite a general set of what we can mean by a quantum theory of gravity. Uh, but if you'd like to make it more concrete and have something specific in mind, um, the, the boundary conditions that we're going to label different boundary conditions by this little b uh, is telling us the, the asymptotic boundary metric on where our, our CFT lives, uh, as well as the sort of normalizable 
sorry, the non-normalizable modes for, for, any, for, the, for any fields we might have uh, that we interpret in CFT as sources for, for the single trace operators. Uh, and if you want to be even more concrete and have a very specific example in mind, if you're familiar with uh, JT gravity, this is a two-dimensional theory of gravity. So it has some one-dimensional boundaries and the invariant information in that theory is what's the regularized length of each of these boundary circles. So your boundary conditions there are labeled by this parameter beta that tells you the length of each boundary. And this set of boundary conditions, we can turn into uh, an abelian algebra. So we can make superpositions of different boundary conditions just by sort of formally saying it's a bit of this boundary condition plus a little bit of this boundary condition. So we just make superpositions like that. Um, and we can also define a product and that product is just saying that this boundary condition times this boundary condition uh, says that we have two different uh, connected components of our boundary. So it's a disjoint union. So for example, this boundary condition here, there's three circles. You can think of this as a product of three different boundary conditions. Okay. So, um, so this is, is what I mean by, by this curly B, this algebra of, uh, of boundary conditions. I should say that uh, Henry, at any point, I should be interrupted for questions. Raphael, so give me up on it already. Yes, uh, just so I understand, the, the spirit here seems to be very much along the lines of, of the uh, Wheel of the Wit equation or the no boundary proposal. I mean, so you're, you're specifying some metric and fields on some boundary and then computing an amplitude or you, com you can compute a wave function with that as, as the argument. Um, so the only thing that's an abelian algebra about this is the aspect that you might have more than one boundary. And is, is that? Yeah, so the, I have a that? specific, when, when I say, maybe it's it's getting a little bit too fancy, the talking, talking about it as an algebra. What I'm saying is that, uh, that I can, um, that, yeah, some, my boundary, the conditions will have different connected components. And I can always, if I have two separate boundary conditions that I could think about independently, I could also think about having both of those boundary conditions. And, and. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's what so I So it's just the product in that, in that kind of um, simple way. Yeah. And this is, I and mean, this is usually too, um, if we're thinking about ADS CFT, for example, these different boundaries would correspond to some sort of partition function you might like to compute in CFT. And saying that there's there's something about taking a product where you take disjoint union is usually tr too trivial to say because, uh, because amplitudes will factorize. So that the partition function on a disjoint union is just the product of the partition function. So there's not much to say. The interesting thing about recent developments is that we have these space-time wormholes that connect together different boundaries like this and spoil this factorization. And these, of course, are important for the page curve as well as, uh, as this JT example. So that's why I'm, I'm highlighting what is at first this sort of trivial fact that you can take disjoint unions of boundaries. Uh, so Henry, so just to confirm, so this abelian nature is independent of uh, matter field or any gauge field or anything like that. Yeah, well, so so the if you have matter fields and gauge fields and so forth, then you probably want to include what the boundary conditions are for those fields as well as the metric. So, so this means so so our boundary conditions label sort of some complete set of boundary conditions for all the fields that you want to specify. Yeah. And the JT, it's very simple because it's just a metric, so the only thing you have to specify is this length. Yeah. But, but more generally, there might be some fields hanging around that you should talk about too. Okay, so given some boundary condition, this is just telling us what our metric does at infinity is not, um, not sort of telling us all that much. We now need to put the dynamics in, into the theory. And um, that means that if you like, that we compute the gravitational path integral with specified boundary conditions. So maybe I have, my boundary has N components, D1 through BN, and I compute the path integral over metrics and other fields with some action. So this eta here is i if I'm thinking of a Lorentzian path integral, or it's a minus one if I'm thinking of a Euclidean path integral. Or, you know, it could be mixed if I have some some um, sort of uh, many-folded time contour and so forth. So, uh, but we do this path integral with the specified boundary conditions, and this computes uh, an amplitude. 
you know, or it need not be a path integral, perhaps we're doing uh, some perturbative calculation of scattering in an asymptotically flat space or using string theory or so forth. But we have some method that says you start with some set of boundary conditions and you get a number out of it. So if you like, it's a map that takes you from um, uh, this map, uh, which will denote with angle brackets, that takes your boundary conditions and assigns a complex number. Okay. And then we might interpret this as some expectation value of operators or, so, or whatever it might be, turning on the context. Okay, um, but before we, uh, this, so this, this has given our, us our amplitudes for our theory. So uh, this is sort of analogous to having the correlation functions of a quantum field theory. If you like. um, but we want to build a Hilbert space uh, for this theory. Uh, and there's actually another ingredient that uh, is going to play a, a crucial role in what I'm going to say today that I want to make very explicit is that you have to make some extra choice. And that's this, uh, this adjoint operation or some notion of CPT conjugation is, is one way to think about this. Uh, so to introduce that, I want to talk about how, to, uh, how you define a Hilbert space starting with the amplitude. So you suppose you know the amplitudes for every possible boundary condition how would you build a Hilbert space out of that or give it a Hilbert space interpretation? And Hilbert spaces in path integrals. Uh, so, uh, Henry, before yes. going on, um, it's not just, just naively, super naively. Uh, the reason why this is a billion is because you're doing path integral. Because, of course, path integral is just insertion, it's just a number. And in operator language, you always choose uh, uh, time order products. You, you don't have any concept of. Uh, you know, if the if the if the location of the field is uh, included in the label label of B, then whatever you do, it's always the same. It's always time order correlation function in the language of the operator formalism. So it's Abelian in that sense, right? Um, yeah. Well, it depends on on exactly what. Okay. So in the path integral language, you can describe. Okay. Well, we sort of get into this a little bit later. But in path integral language, you can describe correlation functions are out of time order, but they involve some. Um, forward and backwards time evolution and so forth. Um, but, um, but then, then you are essentially doubling the field, right? It's like a shrink of course, then, then you can do it. I mean, just like a forward going, the five plus, and then backward going, the five minus, and then you integrate over just, just a real line. And then, yes, that's, that's backward contour. You can do it. But it, that's your kind of changing B, the information about B. Um, yeah, I mean, so perhaps this will my um, um, sort of uh, position will become clearer as we go go through to okay, okay. examples then, later. Then I, yeah. But um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, so uh, from this point of view, I'm thinking of the the operator the operator language is something that you that you uh, that is constructed later, if you like. So you, know, you could always, you know, one way of thinking about quantum mechanics is you start off with path integrals, you build Hilbert spaces by cutting path integrals, and the operator mm -hmm. language is, is just a, is something that's um, uh, that you define later is not part of the definition of the theory. So that's the sort of attitude that I'm taking for at least for. Oh, okay. I think context. you can go that that way. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, as I said, the um, the way you get a Hilbert space starting with path integral is by is by cutting it open into pieces, and you can then uh, uh, think of a, a sort of ket state as being what happens on one side of that cut defines you some state, and then there's a, a bra state if you like on the other side of the cut, and summing over those intermediate states is uh, is is then uh, performed by the path integral by gluing together this, this bra and this ket. So in the context of, of gravity, where um, so you know, often we'll think of there being a, some, some time evolution going on in between quantum field theory or so forth, but, um, but in quantum gravity, the time evolution and the Hamiltonian is of course part of the constraints, so it's part of the uh, redundancy, uh, the gauge redundancy of the theory. So, um, when we're cutting this path integral, the only thing that's um, that's that's gauge invariant is telling me where the uh, boundaries lie in relation to that cut, whether they lie to, to one side or the other. So, um, so from that point of view, we're going to 
uh, define some states by, uh, by some set of boundary conditions, and uh, then we'll define some other state by some other set of boundary conditions. And by doing the path integral with both sets of boundaries, we uh, compute the inner products of these states. But importantly, uh, inner products of Hilbert spaces are of course not um, symmetric, but they're um, skew symmetric. So they pick up a complex conjugate. So to, to define an inner product that makes sense like this, you need some kind of anti-linear operation. That, um, that takes the, the, roughly speaking, tells you how you map a ket state into a bra state. Uh, so you need to have some choice of this operation uh, dagger, if you like. So in, um, in quantum mechanics, for example, our path integrals would be on segments of lines that compute, compute matrix elements of uh, the time evolution operator, something like e to the minus iht, but if I want to take the, a, um, an overlap of two states with some different time evolutions, then I need to uh, have some complex conjugate or time reversal that means that the adjoint of my state, which involves forward time evolution e to the minus iht, becomes a, some e to the plus iht. And uh, so that involves a, uh, like a complex conjugation in the path integral, for example, uh, or something that's perhaps slightly more complicated. Uh, like maybe reversing magnetic fields and so forth. Okay, so so we need this anti-linear operation, and now um, uh, and now we can uh, define this inner product, say between two states B two dagger B three dagger and some other state B one, by taking the adjoint of all the states that live on the uh, in the bra piece of the the overlap. And this is something some operation that squares to one. So um, fine. Okay. So Henry, in this uh, in this slide, the the little b's are still referring to the, the these states are are the boundary states, right? I mean they're so um, so they're, the, they're not states b, at the cut. The label b, yeah, is represents some uh, uh, some boundary condition which consists of a single connected component so that's that's all it means for now and then i'm defining an object that involves putting one of these boundary conditions or so a number of these boundary conditions inside a, a ket and that's i can um and that's just that just defines a vector space for me if you like um but yeah these are uh you think about these as states defined by preparing some initial boundary conditions and uh, and seeing what comes out. I mean, it's really just the boundary conditions that you're cutting, right? Or or dividing into two groups. You're just dividing the and boundary conditions doing a into two goal. groups in the end, yeah. Yeah, so if, if this was doing some, um, if this was in quantum field theory or something, and these were insertions of creating particles in the future or particles in the past, then the notion of where I cut in between them is meaningful uh, because it, you know, it tells me the Cauchy slice where I'm asking about what the state is. Uh, the only thing that's um, uh, a little different in gravity is that if I change the slice I cut along, I should be describing the same state, but in a, in a different gauge. Uh, so that's, mm. that's a redundancy in the description. So the only gauge independent information is this division into kets and bras. I mean, you don't really have a geometry that you could cut until you start doing the path integral and consider individual paths. That's right? absolutely right. Yeah. So this, like this picture here, is not denoting the full path integral. It's denoting some particular configuration of the path integral that I've chosen to cut in a particular way, and I'd have to sum over all possibilities. And for any possibility, I'd have a choice of many ways I could cut it. Um, and you're not actually using, like in this particular picture you've drawn, there would be some states that I could talk about at the cut, but they do not actually enter any of your formulas here, right? No, so you could, so a more direct way of trying to construct this Hilbert space would be to try to make some particular gauge fixing and and describe the, the configurations of fields and some particular spatial slice that I've chosen in some particular way. But you know, especially with topology change, that become, that's, that's a sort of complicated process. So I've kind of avoided all of that by just doing it in this abstract way. But 
think about this as yeah. like the analog in quantum gravity of doing the sort of axiomatic quantum field theory where someone from on high has told me all the correlation functions and I want to make it build something out of that rather than, you know, so I'm not getting my hands dirty and, and actually this is not a terribly practical the, the, thing. The key, the key point is that you can figure out what, what, what the linearly independent states are, I guess, using this. Uh, the, yeah, the key thing here is just that I, it, it's giving me a definite, starting from the boundary conditions, it's giving me some abstract definition of a set of states, and it's giving me a definition of an inner product on those, uh, and the path integral is giving me a definition of the inner product on those states. And once I've done that, then I can build a Hilbert space and start asking about Thanks. operators and the properties of the states and so forth. Yeah, so, um, so yeah. Uh, but the point of this slide was really that this that this dagger operation is is crucial, uh, and we define the inner product in this in this way. The uh, the state is defined by a set of boundaries, or um, and and the inner product is defined by computing the amplitude where we take the adjoint of the boundaries that live in the in the bra. And uh, and 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 then we kind of extend this to superpositions of different sets of boundaries by linearity and from that that's enough to define the uh, baby universe hilbert space by by a completion so this is just a standard thing to say you you can take roughly speaking you're allowed to take some infinite linear combination of different states as long as it converges but in that process you might also find some linear relations between states and they and they get sort of uh, projected out. So these will be states that have zero norm or states that have equivalently states that have zero overlap with every other state. Uh, and there's an important assumption that we're going to make throughout the whole thing, which is that or a requirement on our for this to make be a, be a sensible Hilbert space, which is that this inner product is positive semi-definite. In other words, we are doing quantum mechanics and not not some some generalization with negative norms. Thank you. Um at this point, you are already kind of excluding a covariant formalism of uh, Jan Mills theory, say a ghost can appear inside the loop, and that quantum number cannot appear at the boundary. So if, if you just extend this, it. Um, it would just be saying that ghosts are not, you know, you have to be deciding to describing your boundary conditions, which in that case would be initial and final states in a gauging variant way. Uh, so it wouldn't. But in, I'm saying the intermediate, uh, uh, Intermediate state can include the state it's just excited by goals. Of course, but of course, the state, physical course inner product state. in the end. The physical inner product in the end. Of course, of course, it's, it's positive it's a new state. Exactly, you're just adding a new state. But uh, there's no way to put that in this formalism, right? I mean, that that I think of the ghosts as being some intermediate step that you found convenient to use to compute the amplitude, but it's not something that appears in the amplitudes in the end once you're talking about. Um, gauge invariant inner products. No, no, I, I totally agree. Of course, yeah. I totally agree. So, so the whole, whole point of this is that we're phrasing everything in terms of the, the physical amplitudes in the end. Yes, so that, yeah, that, that, that's what I'm saying. Uh, Namely, so that, from Hilbert like. space, you cannot talk about, you're not talking about uh, Hilbert space or extended Hilbert space, including those kind of negative modes and so on, because you just kind of use B to, to level uh, the states. Uh, yeah. Okay. Any gauge redundancy is already kind of fixed. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see the, I mean, we'll talk more about quantum field theory later and how that sort of fits into this, this paradigm. We'll see okay. kind of, you can ask again if it's. Um... Sorry, Henrik. Uh, can you just clarify what is the tilde in like the third to last line? Oh, it's just, um, it's just saying that these, these guys that appear on the, in this bra are not the same as the guys who appear on the left. So it's just there are N plus M different boundary conditions that might have different values of beta and oh, so forth. It's like um, it's, it's just a label. C1 to CM or something. Like, yeah, okay. I could have written, uh, yeah. And the and the and the dagger is is just completely abstractly defined at this point. At this point, it's completely abstractly defined. It's some it's yeah. That's one of the key one. points is that you have to make a choice. Yeah, it's something that squares to one and and I okay. Um, there's a requirement that if you put a dagger on every every boundary, then the amplitude gets complex conjugated, for example. But but at the moment, it's it's something completely abstract, and we have to make an appropriate choice. Uh, but yeah, that's that's kind of the whole whole point here is that you, you hand me the amplitudes, that is not enough to define a Hilbert space. And there's another, there's mm -hmm. more choices to be made, and sometimes there's more than one choice that, that might give you different constructions. Um, okay, so this is our um, uh, our our recipe. 
uh, that we've gone through so far. Um, so yeah, this is this is going to be what we're what we're using to to cook up various things over the course of the next half hour or so. So if if this sort of construction isn't clear, then uh, do jump in. Okay, good. Um, okay, so there's one more um, thing to, that I'll um, just discuss briefly that, that is then a result of this construction, which is that, um, which is what we talked about to begin with, which is this, um, uh, what I'll call a, the super selected algebra of asymptotic observers. So this is the idea that these kind of, uh, these kind of constructions always give you um, they can, roughly speaking, the baby universes create correlations between different boundaries that lead to things like the non-factorization of partition functions in ADS-CFT, but they only give you um, a particular sort of correlations, which is classical. And the way to describe that is in terms of this algebra observables. So again, completely abstractly at this point, you can define uh, associated to any particular sort of boundary condition, an operator like this, and this operator just adds in an extra boundary. So you can think of this, um, this same amplitude, B1, B2, B3, uh, as a matrix element of some operator. So you start with one boundary down here as a ket, you insert another boundary with an operator B2 hat, and then you've got this third boundary, which is gonna be B3 dagger with the dagger appearing because it's there in the, uh, in the bra piece. So this is another interpretation of the same amplitude. Uh, and um, okay, it's got the property. This is going to justify the use of this uh, dagger on boundary conditions. Is this dagger really acts as an adjoint operation in um, on on this kind of operator? There's a the argument isn't isn't difficult, but uh, it means that this is this is the sensible notation. In other words, the the operator associated with a pending B dagger is the same as the adjoint of the operator associated with inserting B. Um, and also importantly, this is this, because we've done this um, this exercise where we've uh, done this completion, and that we might have these null states. It's not actually immediate that defining an operator like this would give you something well defined. So you really need to check that it's uh, that it is well defined. Uh, but if you follow all the ingredients and these and these sort of axioms are satisfied, then uh, then this is guaranteed. But we'll see an example later where it's actually not if you slightly relax the axioms. Um, and also because of the fact that all of our boundary inserting operators, in, in other words, we don't have an ordering in terms of, uh, it, because our, our algebra was abelian, if you like, these operators also uh, uh, live in an abelian algebra, which means that they commute with that adjoint. And if an operator commutes to this adjoint, it means you can diagonalize it. Uh, just like, so Hermitian operators are of course an example of this, but more generally you can diagonalize any operator that commutes to this adjoint. And, um, and that means that we can actually um, diagonalize all of these boundary inserted operators on the Hilbert space. So in, in particular, there's some, there's some state in the theory that involves the absence of any boundaries, which we'll call this no boundary state, or sort of a hardle hawking state. But, um, it just means at this point, a state defined by not having any boundaries at all. And acting with these operators creates different states. So this, this state here is the operator B1 hat acting on the state HH, for example. And we can simultaneously diagonalize all of these operators, which means we find these states, special states alpha, that are simultaneous eigenstates for all possible boundaries with some eigenvalues B alpha. That depend both on what the kind of boundary is and what the the state alpha is. And okay. Oh, uh, Henry, okay. sorry, can I interrupt you again? Um, I think I'm missing a subtlety here. When you write that acting with these operators B hat on the no boundary state creates a dense set in the Hilbert space. Um, naively, I would have thought, how could it be otherwise? Given that I thought the Hilbert space was constructed by basically taking all these operators exactly and then why. weeding out the null state. Ah, okay, good, good. That's exactly right, yeah. So you, the things you create directly are things with finitely many boundaries, and this forms a dense set because, because you take the completion. So sort of by construction, this is... 
Okay, um, so once you've gone to this diagonal basis, this is a complete set of commuting operators that you can have a complete diagonal, uh, a diagonal basis, and you can insert them inside any amplitude as intermediate states. And what you find then is, uh, is that you have the only uh, sort of unknown in this is the overlap of these alpha states with this no boundary state, uh, this hardle hawking state, and you end up with this, the formula like this. We're not really going to make much use of this later, but um, this is sort of the, uh, the key result that the, the worst that, you know, the, the, you might think these space-time wormholes can induce some complicated quantum correlations between different boundaries, but the fact that everything commutes with everything else tells you that, no, it just gives you some classical probability distribution, which means you can describe, for example, JT or something like it. You can always describe it by a classical ensemble of, of theories and not like a quantum superposition of theories or something strange like that. Okay. Or another way of saying it is that the space-time wormholes um, break cluster decomposition, but they only do it in a specific way to, uh, that is not actually observable for any particular um, observer. It's okay. okay, I should get on to examples. Um, Sorry, Henry, I, I just had a quick question before we move on. Yeah. Um, so just in comparing with the regular quantum field theory, um, usually when we talk about axiomatic Euclidean quantum field theory, one thing we say is that correlation functions, uh, operator ordering and correlation functions doesn't matter except when the two operators are on top of each other. But then when you go to Lorentzian, then you get light, light cone branch cut. So the Lorentzian ordering starts becoming important. But here, is it fair to say that like regardless of whether I'm talking about Euclidean or Lorentzian, the ordering of the operators is always trivial or um, does the analytic continuation have some non-trivial structure to it? Um, we're going to talk about those examples specifically later. So perhaps is it okay to defer that? Um, that yeah, sure. Yeah, no, no question to the end. Um, Um, yeah. So I'll, um, I was expecting the setup to take half the time, so I think we're in good shape. Um, okay, so, um, so we're going to put these things to work in the context of uh, one dimensional theories of gravity now. Um, so if, if the, everything that came before wasn't entirely clear, then hopefully some examples uh, will, will help uh, make it a little bit more concrete. Uh, so first of all, uh, to define a one-dimensional theory of gravity, we need to integrate over um, one-dimensional Riemannian manifolds. But luckily, they're they're pretty simple. So a one-D Riemannian manifold is made up only of some intervals, which are labelled by the total length of the interval uh, and possibly some circles. Uh, but these these um, circles are only going to affect some overall normalization and they, they don't have any boundaries. So we're actually going to, to be free to, to just forget about those and, uh, and just think about these intervals. And then the, uh, the boundary conditions for our one dimensional space times, uh, we're going to think about uh, are just going to be some collection of points where, uh, where these intervals can end. And, um, and there'll also be some, some matter fields, if you like, propagating on our, on our one-dimensional space-time. So there'll be some quantum mechanics that lives on each, each interval. And uh, along with some, uh, our set of points, they're going to be labeled by some, some uh, matter field configuration. So it's going to be some state of the quantum mechanics that lives on, on each of these endpoints. Okay, um, so then if we want to compute amplitudes, uh, we have some collection of points. Uh, we need to build a space-time that has that is bounded by this collection of points. Um, but this is just going to be uh, a case of pairing up the points in some way. Uh, so that means that we uh, that each space-time involves a particular choice of pairing, say, the first boundary with the second boundary, and the third boundary with the fourth, or possibly the first boundary with the third boundary, and the second boundary with the fourth, or and so forth. So all the possible pairings of these points, and of course, to be bounded by some intervals, there need to be an even number of these points. That's up to be two n. And then we only have to worry about computing the amplitudes for 
at each particular interval. Uh, so there'll be some kind of single universe amplitudes, if you like, that, uh, that correspond to each, uh, each, uh, each one dimensional universe that stretches between some, end, some beginning point bi and some end point vj. Okay. So there are some sort of generalizations you could do to, to give this a little bit more structure that will maybe make some comments along, along the way as one is you could choose your space times to have an orientation I'm just this is, doesn't add uh, too much more but just the simplicity we're going to have on un unoriented space times um, something that's more complicated is because one dimensional manifolds aren't so interesting and in particular we might want to describe topology change and so forth uh, we should we could generalize this to allow not just one dimensional manifolds but actually graphs so in other words we allow some vertices where where our universe is split and join and we'll kind of comment uh, as to what the generalization is along the way for that. But the main thing we'll focus on is just this very simple case. Anyway, okay. Yes. Do you consider circles when you include the uh, interactions? Since they yeah. maybe uh, like link together the circles? Well, the circle, so once you include interactions, perhaps you could have something that looks like a circle, but then, then has a vertex where it splits off some other line. You'd have to consider that. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, you linking together like this. So there's not they're not sort of living in some some space uh, uh -huh. uh, in there's a, a moment they're just sort of abstract space time manifolds. So it's so yeah they wouldn't we need to consider they don't they only affect the normalization in the end. So we're not going to worry okay. about them. Yeah, I they, think about these like in quantum field theory when you have uh, like vacuum bubbles, you just you can always have that. There's some exponential of vacuum bubbles, and okay, in that context, they contribute to the cosmological constant, say, but it's just some normalization. It doesn't, you never really worry about them. Okay, so, um, so the only thing we have to worry about are these single universe amplitudes that describe a single interval. And then everything else is built up in this sort of wick contraction way that's familiar from, from free quantum field theory. Okay, so our single universe amplitudes. Uh, then look something like this. We have to we have this modulus that is the total length of the universe. It's the only thing that's left of the integral over metric. So we should integrate over this modulus over some some domain. It'll be one of the the choices that we have to make here. And then our universe is described by some path integral quantum mechanical path integral uh, over uh, a time of length t. It could be Euclidean or Lorentzian. There's some matter fields that we're going to call x. So the examples we're going to consider is when this quantum mechanics is described by a sigma model on some, on some manifold M target. So our action is given by some, uh, some kinetic term and uh, a, uh, a potential term on this, this target space. And um, so that you can also think of this as a quantum mechanics where the Hamiltonian is given by a Laplacian plus some potential. And in particular, this manifold could have any signature we like at this stage. So it could be Euclidean, it could be Lorentzian, it could have some funny mixed signature. Um, but okay, so this is a pretty general class of models that's, um, that's going to be useful for connecting to quantum field theory. Um, good, and then the boundary conditions we have to set are, there's basically only one thing we can do, which is in terms of the path integral, you specify uh, at the beginning and end of our interval, which point in target space our fields take on. So they're just points in target space, give us the boundary conditions. You could specify a more general wave function, but that's just taking a, suit, a linear superposition of these guys. So it's enough to just consider these, these states, sort of position eigenstates, if you like. And then this path integral, we can write in Hamiltonian language in terms of matrix elements, which are now matrix elements within the matter theory, within this, this just a quantum mechanics. Uh, and then we'll, the, Baby universe Hilbert space will be something slightly different that we build out of this. Okay. Uh, so the sort of thing to have in mind here is um, just to, to orient you with the way I'd like to, to think about this is to, to have in mind a, a generalization to some higher dimensional models. So we can think of this one dimensional theory as being uh, like a mini superspace uh, model where we're talking about some cosmology that has some spatial geometry and we're going to simplify life by specifying our geometry has some symmetries it's 
maybe homogeneous. So, okay, an example here is this as a Bianchi one where you have a homogeneous universe, which uh, has some some different scalings in different directions, which give you a finite dimensional space of, of universes that you integrate over. And, uh, and then you're left with just a quantum mechanics that describes this finite dimensional space of, of possible spatial configurations over time. Uh, and the example of this, this Bianchi one, if you scale time in the right way, and okay, there are various subtleties that aren't important for what I want to say, but you end up with uh, your, your target space is, um, is just um, a three-dimensional Lorentzian space with uh, that. So the Hamiltonian becomes a, a Laplacian on a, a one comma two signature space where the, what you call the time direction in this, uh, in this Lorentzian space is telling you about how big the universe is and the X1 and X2 tell you about anisotropies is what, the, what shape the universe is roughly. Um, so this is the sort of thing I'd like to, to have in mind when um, the, this is, is some approximation to a uh, some crude approximation to a higher dimensional model. Okay, so that's the sort of generalities about how we can build one dimensional theories of gravity and the kind of things to have in mind. So let's uh, get more concrete again. Um, so I'm going to start off by thinking about uh, Euclidean uh, theories. Um, so um, if we want to talk about Euclidean theory, that means that this time evolution operator in computing these one universe amplitudes, which describe a single interval, uh, I get this e to the minus ht. Uh, and if I want this to have any chance of this making sense, uh, I need my Hamiltonian to be bounded below and I need to only integrate over positive values of this parameter t, because otherwise it's going to be, um, or something equivalent to that. Otherwise it's going to, to so like this, this model, for example, wouldn't work because the Hamiltonian is not bounded from below or bounded from above. Um, so the constraint that I've chosen a Euclidean world line tells me that my target space has to be Euclidean as well, for example, in this, in this context, so that we only have positive kinetic energies. Uh, and you, okay, you can just do this integral and the thing you get is one over the Hamiltonian uh, and of course, the inverse of the Hamiltonian is a, has another name. It's just the Green's function. Uh, so, uh, for, for whatever Hamiltonian we had. So this in these, um, uh, if maybe if our potential, we call it something like m squared over two, uh, and then this is just the uh, if it's a constant potential, then this would just be the Green's function for the um, Klein-Gordon equation. In other words, it would be the a propagator. Or, oh, in other words, again, it's a two-point function of a scalar quantum field theory that lives on on uh, on our target space. Um, so, uh, this was describing a single universe amplitudes, but because the multi-universe amplitudes, where I have many boundaries, are built up by Wick contractions, I know that I can write it in terms of a Gaussian integral. So, I can write it at least formally in terms of an integral over some field that lives on the target space uh, with some action with a with a potential like this. And Henry, I'm, I'm sorry, could you go back just very briefly and remind us of where you introduced the target space? Um, yeah, so the target space was this uh, in the definition of, of what I'm calling the matter theory. Um, yeah, so perhaps the simplest example to have in mind might be if I have a one dimensional target space, then the and then u is a quadratic or something, then this would be a simple harmonic oscillator. But okay, this is this is the target space. In 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 the language of these, you gave us this example of the mini superspace models where x is basically just like a scale factor or something. Uh, can you help me think of this target space in that setting? Yeah. So in this context, for example, where you have this mini superspace model, um, uh, then. Uh, the target space is a, is a three-dimensional Lorentzian space. And the, so you, you, you write your mini superspace model and you compute the, um, the, the action and you um, do a Legendre transform. It tells you what the constraints look like. And that gives you, it tells you the, the Hamiltonian, which is you know, the Hamiltonian constraints of your mini superspace model. And that'll have some kinetic terms that you can package in a metric and then maybe some potential terms. And so ultimately it will look something like this for the appropriate. 
okay, then may, you know, depending on if it's not time reversal invariant, then you might have some magnetic field or something as well. But does that help? So in that example, the target space is R12. In that example, the target space is, is R12. That's right. This is a sort of Kazan universe. Yeah. So it's just saying the constraints, the Hamiltonian constraint in GR is, of course, not positive semi-definite. It can have positive directions and negative directions. And um, uh, so okay, that means our manifold yeah. can have yeah. any signature. Yeah. 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 So you know, if we were doing full superspace, then this would be an infinite dimensional manifold that has infinitely many pluses and infinitely many minuses and so forth. So we're doing a toy of that. Okay, um, so yeah, once you've written your, our, our amplitudes in terms of these Gaussian integrals, it's kind of obvious how we would um, generalize these amplitudes to uh, if our space time includes graphs, these graphs in this context of writing it as in terms of a quantum field theory, have another name, they're called Feynman diagrams. And they, of course, correspond to some having some cubic or quartic or higher terms in this in this action. So there's kind of an obvious generalization to space times that split and join. Um, that doesn't have yeah okay it has a slightly more complicated description, but um, you can see the generalization. Okay, so these this is the amplitudes. So this this gives us um, the first two ingredients that we started that we asked for. One is the the set of amplitudes which we've defined by these, this Green's function and a set of boundary conditions that are defined by these uh, positions in target space. But we still need our third ingredient. So let's just start off by doing the obvious thing that we do in gravity. And that's you take the adjoint operation to act trivially on points in target space. So I think if you were doing these mini superspace models, this would be your first kind of guess as to, as to what you might do. And in that context, in that, um, uh, what the result of that is that the baby universe Hilbert space, okay, it's a Fox space because we have wick contractions, that's not surprising. So we only have to consider the, the states of a single universe, um, a single one dimensional universe. Uh, and the inner product is given by sort of convolving with the Green's function. Uh, so in other words, the inner product is literally just the inverse of the Hamiltonian. So you could, instead of going to an X basis, we could go to a basis where we diagonalize the Hamiltonian. And then the inner product is just given by dividing by the energy eigenvalue and is diagonal in the in this Hamiltonian basis. Okay. And in particular, it's, it's manifestly positive definite because the inner product is built from this one over the Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian we chose to be positive. This is a positive operator and that tells us the inner product is positive. So we've got a good Hilbert space. So that makes us happy. Uh, it doesn't have any null states to talk about in any obvious way. Um, and we can talk about uh, general states, which are going to be superpositions of, of okay, no boundaries, the hardle hawking state with some coefficient, one boundary that's labeled by a point in target space with some weighting function, F1, or we could have two boundaries, weights, which are defined by a pair of points given by, weighted by some function, which is symmetric in those points, and could have larger numbers of universes, larger numbers of boundaries. And we can package this into, uh, the Taylor expansion of a functional of our field. Uh, and this is, um, this is contains exactly the same information. And then you can check by sort of weight contractions and, and the usual things we're familiar with from quantum field theory, that the inner product of two states given by these two different functionals is given by just inserting these two things in the path integral. So it's computing the expectation value of F times the complex conjugate of G if you like. Uh, so, um, so states are functionals of fields on target space. Um, and um, one way to, to uh, interpret this is, is to think about um, this sort of Euclidean path integral as describing a, a classical statistical system. So something like a Gibbs ensemble for like an easing model or something like that. And these phi's describe a continuum limit of some sum over spins. And this F and this G are, are weighting functions for all the different spin configurations. So perhaps F could be something like the, the average magnetization, or it could be the something that tells me about the spin on a particular point. But these things are all, all observables we could compute in our classical statistical theory, something like an easing model. 
And the inner product that we define here is describing a covariance matrix of, uh, of these different observables. It's just um, telling, us, telling us how observables are correlated, what their expectation values are, what their variances are, and, and so forth. Um, okay. So this is a nice Hilbert space and as a, uh, is a sort of standard construction of probability theory. What it is not is the ordinary quantum field theory Hilbert space that you would, that you would um, find discussed in, in your favorite quantum field theory textbook. Um, Sorry, Henry, um, should I not think of these states as um, taking a line segment and then just cutting them at some point as if there was like a time slice? Am I allowed to think of these that way? Yeah, so you can absolutely think of things that way, um, with the only subtlety that uh, that you have to think then about uh, some gauge fixing is that if you the actual time where you cut that state is not uh, like a physical thing, it's a gauge. It involves some choice of gauge, so you then have to impose constraints. But so, so when you say that there are no null states in the theory, are you talking about like the physical Hilbert space? if you had quotient it out, I, I would have thought if there's any gate, like um, sort of gauge redundancy in how you cut the path integral, then you're gonna get null states of some kind. Um, yeah, so it's just telling us in this context that there's not some surprising linear relations between, um, between boundaries. And actually there's something, um, that you're not actually imposing the constraints in like a strong sense that like fixes you to zeros of the Hamiltonian. The fact is that, that our amplitudes, because they depend on, uh, because they basically come from the inverse of the Hamiltonian, they actually care about the whole Hamiltonian spectrum. They're not just truncating to uh, doing some um, truncation to gauge invariant states. So, I mean, the reason for that is that there's an endpoint in this interval, which um, I see. That's, but, is that but that's a related what, thing. Is that what I said? Like, maybe, maybe there is no way to construct like kind of goes to Fox space or something because you're leveling the operator by B which is kind of on shell, on shell degrees of freedom. You just specify on shell degrees of freedom and you use that operator B to construct the Hilbert space. Suddenly you're already gauge fixed. You don't have anything bigger than that. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Yeah, yeah so like, yeah, if, yes, I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if I just get through the Euclidean constructions, then I think that's fine. We'll get the main point across. Um, so, um, so the, the... we are not very strict with the time. Yeah, you can take Fine. your time. Especially yeah. since we asked you a lot of questions, the more important thing is to learn something. So yeah. well, uh, thanks for just, just so, take your time. I will, I'll take my time with that. To be honest, the Lorentzian pieces are, are much, there's much less to, to say. So I'm, so this is um, too bad. Thanks for that. Okay. Um, um, Okay, are there any more questions about this, this particular sort of construction where we, we start with these amplitudes for quantum field theory, Euclidean quantum field theory, um, and we do the obvious definition of an adjoint, we build a Hilbert space, and okay, it's a nice Hilbert space, it has a very nice interpretation, but it is not the, the, what, we, what is usually meant by the quantum field theory Hilbert space. Um, so that raises the question about how you would actually construct a Hilbert space in, in say, let's say Euclidean quantum field theory. So that means we're actually going to start with exactly the same set of correlators, um, but make a different choice for, um, for some of the other uh, choices that we made, in particular this adjoint. Okay. So as we said, that we, we constructed a Hilbert space that's not Euclidean Hilbert space. So let's just emphasize a few differences. For, um, uh, so first of all, our Hilbert space was defined by some functionals that depend on the fields on the entirety of target space. Whereas uh, if you think about quantum field theory, maybe your target space is some spatial manifold times time, then you usually describe the Hilbert space by cutting along some particular time and describing wave functionals that depend only on the fields of that time slice, not of fields at every possible time. So that's kind of a, a clear uh, difference here. And as we've um, commented to um, yeah, Ven's question, we're not um, here, we're not on shell. So um, 
another way of saying the same thing is that if you diagonalize the Laplacian of your theory, uh, the usual quantum field theory Hilbert space, say a free quantum field theory, would be a Fox space built out of the on-shell particles. So what we normally think of, uh, of on-shell particles of positive frequency, uh, del squared equals m squared. But this Hilbert space um, is built out of really all the eigenvalues. So it's, it's not imposing the constraints in the strong sense like that. Um, so the reason is that when we construct the Hilbert space of quantum field theory, uh, we actually make a different choice of, of the adjoint. And that choice involves a, a reflection in Euclidean time. Um, so we'll call this thing uh, sigma. So this is, if you're, you have the case where your target space is some spatial manifold times some time, this is uh, uh, Euclidean time goes to minus Euclidean time. And that's telling us about the Hilbert space at uh, T Euclidean equals zero. Um, so let's uh, talk about that in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, from that point of view, now our amplitudes, if we def define, take this um, reflection, the amplitudes are given by the same sort of Green's function, two-point function, um, but a two-point function that includes a reflection on the, say, the second uh, coordinate. Um, but this is actually a problem if we want to define a Hilbert space. Um, so again, it's going to be a Fox space built from these single universe amplitudes. So this, this amplitude is defining an, an inner product from single universe states, if you like. Um, but this doesn't define something that's positive definite. So one way to understand that is before we argue, argue for positive definiteness by saying that the Hamiltonian or the inverse of the Hamiltonian is a positive operator, the same is not true if you compose the Hamiltonian with a reflection. So yeah, this is, um, you can, you could simultaneously diagonalize the Hamiltonian and the reflection, and the reflection will have eigenvalues plus one and minus one. So it can't possibly be positive definite. Um, yeah, so in other words, odd um, field configurations that are odd under reflection would give you some negative norm states. Um, so actually we have to put in some additional constraint and that's a constraint on the boundary conditions, which is that we only allow um, boundary conditions that involve points in the target space in half of the target space, we'll call M target minus, which is the, the past in Euclidean time. And okay, we've arrived at it in a kind of unfamiliar way, but those of you who know a little uh, axiomatic quantum field theory will perhaps recognize what we've ended up with as the osterwald schrader construction of uh, QFT Hilbert space. So one way to think about this is you want to define a state on the spatial slice sigma, um, so you can do that by a path integral over a, a half manifold with some sources turned on or some operators inserted. And that defines a state in the target space. And then if you want to define the inner product of two such states, you, uh, you do a time reflection on one of the states and then you glue them together and do the full and compute the correlation functions. So it involves this Euclidean reflection. Um, and uh, and that's um, yeah. And using the same language before as functionals of fields, uh, now we only allow our functionals of fields to depend on the half space because we've put this restriction on on our boundary conditions. Uh, so that's uh, and then we also insert this reflection in um, in in one of them. So that means that this function f only depends on fields in the lower half, the past half, and this g, when it's, because I've included this reflection, only depends on fields in the upper half. So that means we can do the path integral in two pieces. We can do the path integral over the lower half and a path integral over the upper half, uh, except we have to fix the point where they're joined, the fields on this slice sigma where the, where the, the two guys are joined. And we can describe this path integral over the lower half as a wave functional in terms of the fields at the join. And the, similarly for the, the future half, you get a, a, a conjugate wave functional for the, uh, for the fields in the other half. Um, and then this is the standard inner product that we expect for wave functionals in quantum field theory, and it's manifestly positive. Is that true that this way you can do uh, whatever? For example, uh, if you start from B, to specify B is the only operator you introduced, I assume, and B to specify the uh, the parameters of the boundary as in original way, 
namely some on-shell parameter. Then, of course, you cannot construct, say, ghost uh, fox space because you are using B operator, which parameterize on-shell state. And instead, you can say that B carries an index of the ghost numbers and so on. So you can expand the B, right? And then instead, so, so you can construct all these ghost fox space. And instead, you restrict the boundary condition in such a way that like B, BRST, that something does not include the excitation of the ghost and so on. In this case, it's only G2, but you can do the same. You can say the same thing. Okay, B is now, it's also quantity. You can uh, uh, build all the operators and do, do whatever the off-shell states you want to construct, you can construct. And then claiming that, or you can restrict uh, to the boundary condition to the quote, quote, on-shell state in a consistent way. Yeah, the, the strategy here in that, in that context is analogous to saying that we construct the Hilbert space from correlation functions of gauge invariant operators. How you compute those correlation functions, whether you include ghosts or what, whatever it is, is up to you, but we're never, we're never introducing um, so it's really the, I mean, th this is part of the point of view of this Ostwald de Schrader mm -hmm. idea is you want to build the Hilbert space starting with gauge invariant observables in the first place and never having to yeah, talk about Yeah, that, that's the most naive way but, you're yeah. saying, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you so can that's, probably that's extend this, right? I mean, it's just- so, so yeah, there may be, just and just like in quantum gravity, we describe this, you know, building a Hilbert space by starting with knowing all the amplitude, which is obviously very difficult. In practice, you probably have to do something more complicated to choose an appropriate gauge fixing and, and so forth, you know, which is, if you want to do something more practical, if you probably have to start doing those things. But um, yeah, we're taking so the this point is to understand that what you have been doing is baby universal ensemble is corresponding to what in QFT language? Yeah, uh, it's trying to, to ask the question whether we should think about uh, the Hilbert space of many universes, kind of like a quantum field theory, if you like, built out of um, uh, built out of states of a single universe, or uh, something like this. So that, this sort of yeah, the words that often get assigned to this are third quantization, right? That you mm -hmm. start with configurations of all possible universes, and you mm -hmm. and you then yeah, so the, I mean, this term is kind of ambiguous and doesn't have a clear definition in the literature, so I kind of avoided it. But um, and it seems yeah. so, so. It's asking the question whether doing third quantization to to universes and is this is this telling us the right thing if we try and extrapolate that from doing second quantization of particles mm -hmm. to give us quantum field theory? Mm -hmm. And part of the answer here is that actually um, not necessarily if we're yeah. Um, yeah. that we're really yeah. doing something, uh, the, the, the natural thing to do in gravity may be a bit different. Yeah, much more restrictive. Yeah. It's abelian and then, you know, you don't, you don't care the order. So no commutator or nothing, right? Um, yeah, but it's sort of telling us where that comes from is part of the language. Okay, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so like, again, here, there's actually no order. We still haven't ordered things. A correlation function in Euclidean signature is just a correlation function. There's no room for order. Yeah, yeah. Um, in Laurentian, you probably have to do much more if you want to. So we'll, yeah. Stuff, right? yeah. Depending on your patience, I can maybe mention the yeah, 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 There's yeah, not too much yeah. to say. Okay, I'm but, trying um, to just understand. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. That's, 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 that's good. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. So yeah, I, so one of the things we might uh, just mention, the last thing here is that um, that you get many, many null states from this. And that comes from, from the fact that your quantum field theory satisfies equations of motion. Um, the, the reason that didn't work, that argument didn't work over here it's because you have contact terms because the endpoints of different intervals can collide with one another. And those contact terms violate the equations of motion. But because we've separated our, so we've, from past boundaries and future boundaries, uh, something that's in the future half and the past half, they can never collide. So you don't get these contact terms. And that's why you get these null states. And actually the, now the fields, now the states are not functionals on the entirety of target space, but they only correspond to functionals on sigma. And that, that represents a, this massive kind of redundancy. Um, okay, yeah, and the last comment about this Euclidean thing is that, um, that we've actually violated the axioms in a specific way that was perhaps a bit implicit in the first, when we sort of first wrote them down, which is that our set of boundary conditions is not invariant under our adjoint operation, because our allowed boundary conditions only involve things in the Euclidean past, and the adjoint takes you to things in the Euclidean future. So this looks like it's sort of a minor violation, but it really does great. Uh, it, it sort of destroys lots of our general arguments. 
Uh, and actually, it turns out that the boundary inserting operators aren't actually well defined on the physical Hilbert space, is that they don't leave null states invariant. Um, and, um, and in fact, there's no, there isn't really a quantum field theory algebra in Euclidean signature because correlators only make sense in Euclidean time order. Uh, so you can't really discuss an algebra in a sensible way. But, uh, okay, so yeah, this is a specific way that we violate our axioms. And that's why we don't usually think of the observables of QFT being having this super selection structure. Okay. Um, what's a sort of reasonable amount of time to, uh, there's really not too much to say on the, the Lorentzian things. So they'll be much quicker than those Euclidean pieces, but um, I don't want to push your, your uh, patience. So. I think we're fine. Um, you know, it, it, it breaks up into natural sections here. So if some people have to leave, that's too bad. But I think it should just keep going. Okay, thanks, Rafael. Okay, so um, it's time to um, move past this Euclidean signature on our world line and think about what happens with a, a Lorentzian uh, space time. Our space time is our one dimensional thing. Um, and this is, so this means that we're, that to compute our one universe amplitudes, we now have e to the minus i h t, not e to the minus h t. And then we've got a few options as to what we do with this integral over the laps uh, t. So for now, let's just, uh, I'm going to make a, a, a decision and I'm going to integrate t over uh, positive and negative values. This is a choice that I can make. And, um, and of course, the integral of an exponential is a delta function. Uh, so that means that our single universe amplitudes are computed by starting with our, some uh, matter states and basically projecting onto solutions of the constraints. So this is, this is um, okay, so it falls into this, this paradigm of, um, of group averaging that has been used for sort of many years and um, constrained systems. But it's kind of a, a natural thing to do if you've got a, um, a uh, if you have some, um, yeah, okay, it's just a projection onto the gauge invariant states. Uh, so maybe just a, a point to make here is that this target space now could have any signature whatsoever. As long as our Hamiltonian has continuous spectrum at zero, our, Hamil our matter Hamiltonian doesn't have to be bounded above, it doesn't have to be bounded below, it can have positive and negative directions. Um, it could have some zero times, one time, or many times, if you like. Uh, and this thing still, still makes perfect sense. Um, and again, the natural choice that you can take is that the adjoint does nothing on target space. And because a delta function is a positive uh, distribution, you end up with a positive semi-definite inner product. Um, and this is a, a very natural and a very general way to, to try to build um, try to build a Hilbert space. And this is um, something that uh, sort of lots of people have studied and in various contexts. Uh, and in particular, uh, there's lots of null states here precisely because we're doing this projection onto the solutions of the constraints. So two states that differ off shell will be the same uh, in the physical Hilbert space. Right. So this is a nice uh, natural thing to do, but um, again, this is certainly not uh, quantum field theory. Um, so um, let's discuss how you might try to get to Lorentzian quantum field theory. And for that, um, if you want to build the amplitudes, so uh, we have the same matter Hamiltonian, uh, but we're going to build a different set of amplitudes by making a different choice for this integral over T. Um, and, uh, and that just means integrating over uh, over positive values, um, and okay, you can you can write it. Uh, this is well defined as a as a distribution. So if you have if you have states that have a nice um, have a sufficiently rapidly decaying energy representation, then um, then this is uh, then this distribution makes sense. Uh, so another way to write the distribution is as a principal value of the of the inverse of the Hamiltonian plus some delta function, um, but from quantum field theory used to writing it in terms of some i epsilon prescription. 
And this is something that's well defined, again, for very general Hamiltonians. So again, the signature could be Euclidean, Lorentzian, or have many times. Um, but this is something very familiar if the target space is some spatial manifold times time, because this is just I times the Feynman propagator. And the familiar I epsilon prescription from, uh, from column field theory 101. Um, but if you make some obvious choices of the adjoint operation here, um, then you don't end up with an inner product that's positive semi-definite or in fact, even Hermitian. So you know, when we did this for in Euclidean space, we, we arrived at something that was at least sort of sensible for, um, uh, for a Hilbert space. It wasn't the common field theory Hilbert space, but it was something sensible. But here we, we really don't get a Hilbert space. This, this is just obviously not a positive operator. It's got some imaginary part and some real part. Okay. Um, so that leaves the question as to how we build the Lorentzian quantum field theory in a product. And as we know from quantum field theory, this single universe amplitude said it's basically the Feynman propagator. We, do, we don't interpret it as the overlaps of states created by acting with operators like before, but as has already been pointed out once or twice in the questions, we actually interpret it as a time ordered state, uh, as a time ordered, the expectation value of a time ordered product. So the ordering then depends on the ordering in, uh, in Lorentzian time. So in particular, this means that while the amplitudes themselves are defined in great generality for any sort of target space, uh, once, if we want to make this kind of construction work, we really need our target space to be time-oriented Lorentzian manifold, so we can define what we mean by a time ordering and have some hope of, of building a um, building a Hilbert space. And I won't say too much about sort of how you go about building a uh, the Lorentzian quantum field the Hilbert space, apart from to say that if you want to define inner products like this, you need to put some extra labels on the boundaries. So one way to think about this is that you have, from the path integral point of view, you have uh, 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 you do the path integral on a contour with many folds and you then to define the time ordering you have to give an extra label telling me what fold my operator lives on or another way of thinking about it is that you give each operator a little displacement in imaginary time so you give each operator a little i epsilon and then the ordering is defined by the ordering of those i epsilons but whatever you do you have to tell me some extra information uh, about you, know, you have to give some extra labels to the boundaries and that, uh, and that is sort of deviating from our, from our axioms that, uh, that say that our boundaries are just um, uh, come without these kind of labels. Um, yeah, there's kind of an interesting aside here that actually this, um, this construction of the Hilbert space and the correlation functions works for any Lorentzian space time, doesn't have to be static or anything. And it actually defines a, a Gaussian state for us uh, for any space time in a really kind of relatively simple way. And there's uh, an exercise if you're interested is to try to work out. We, we have a, a guess for what that state is, but, um, but we, we don't know how to prove it. Yeah. So an exercise is to prove that. Because it's, it's, it's might be yeah, kind of a neat construction for quantum field theory and curve space time. But... Okay, um, so with that, I think I'll wrap up and um, perhaps there'll be some, some more questions. Thank you for all the questions so far. Um, but let's kind of summarize the, the main kind of conclusion here. Um, so the first thing is that if we want to define a gravitational theory, which involves some uh, Hilbert space in particular, interpretation of, of um, amplitudes, it's not just enough to define what fields I have, what the dynamics are. There's some extra, uh, extra choices required that can really make a difference. Um, so boundary conditions, what this adjoint is and how you impose constraints and, and so forth. Uh, are um, uh, really make a difference in the end to what physics you, you describe and the way you interpret it. Uh, and the other point here is that if you really want to try to naively import what we learned from quantum field theory, thinking about it as a second quantization of particles and try to think about, um, about quantum gravity with multiple universes in the same way, uh, then, you're, uh, then you might uh, sort of, that, that may not lead you to the physics you want. So maybe I won't go through all my extra, uh, sort of comments here, given the time, but I'll just give one example of the kind of physics that you end up with that looks very different. And so there's, um, uh, I think it's this it's Kantowski Sachs model, I think it's called, the mini superspace of a, uh, S1, S2 times time. Um, 
that gives you a uh, a um, a sigma model on um, on two dimensional Minkowski space with this potential. And the thing to note about this potential is it goes to negative infinity at uh, far in the in the future, if you like. And x zero here is like the size of the universe, or e to the x zero is like the size of the universe. And if you solve the constraints and ask what the classical dynamics of this model looks like, it looks like some big bang, big crunch cosmology. So it means that your world line starts off time-like, it goes space-like at some point, and then it goes time-like back in the other direction again, which, okay, it looks strange from quantum field theory, but is uh, because this time is really the size of the universe is nothing surprising. So this is the kind of physics that you'd expect to describe, and you can then ask, let's try and quantize that theory. But if you do this naively by trying to ask about the quantum field theory with this that lives in this target space with this potential, you get some very different looking physics. And what you get instead is uncontrolled pair production of, of particles that gets more and more um, dramatic as you go further and further in the future that's caused by this running potential. And so the physics you end up with, depending on these choices you can make, can really be dramatically different. Uh, and so you, you know the, you, sh the, you should take some care with these choices. Um, so with that, I'll uh, people who are very keen can read my slides on the video at the end. But um, yeah, thanks again for your attention and for your excellent questions. And if there are any more, then uh, fire away. Thanks for your attention. Let's all thank Henry. So before also we open for questions, I think there's one in the chat. So maybe. Charles is still there and wants to ask or wants me to read. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so my question was, so for the Lorentzian space, you had a H minus one, eps one epsilon, uh, I times epsilon in the denominator, but for the Euclidean space, you didn't. So I wonder uh, how is that well defined for the Euclidean theory because of the singularity uh, at equals zero? Um, yeah, so this is, um essentially why we made we were forced in the Euclidean signature to make a very particular choice of this um, integration contour, if you like, over of T, is that um, if H, so if H uh, is not positive definite, so maybe if our, maybe um, perhaps the Hamiltonian is something like a negative constant, do you like a negative cosmological constant plus a free particle or something like that, then it would have support at negative energies. But then this integral would, would not converge. You diverge very badly at large T and though this wouldn't make any sense. So that's, that, that's all fitting together is that, you've, that, um, that you have some constraints on the Hamiltonian for this to make sense. Um, whereas at least in a distributional sense, uh, this integral makes sense for uh, as long as it's sandwiched between states that have uh, that that um, that are that, that are, are nice in the appropriate sense that we could make more. Um, yeah, they have to uh, decay at sufficiently rapidly at large energies and are sufficiently smooth in energy. Then this integral makes sense in the distributional sense, even if the Hamiltonian isn't positive definite, even if it has support at zero. But um, but this is just a way of writing um, what this integral means in a distributional sense. Um, okay, thank yeah. you. Feel, yeah, if that, I hope that doesn't explain, then do follow up. But, um, yeah, so, okay, it looks like this. So it's, so yeah, it's, it's, it's this principal value, if you like, gives you a, a, a particular way of subtracting that singularity. So any more questions for Henry? I think I need a little more help with the moral of the story. Uh, is, is the, I, I, was, I was trying to understand why you, so you were somehow telling us on the one hand that, um, well, you, you, were, you were trying to somehow set up the situation in such a way that in the end, the theory you would get would be like quantum field theory on the, on the target space. Um, yeah, so well, what I was trying to do was, was start off by really taking the perspective from the, the sort of gravitational perspective from the world line and trying to cook up what looked like a natural Hilbert space and arrived at something that um, that wasn't the quantum field theory Hilbert space. And 
perhaps that's the moral of the the thing I'm I'm trying to get across is that if you um, if you were to start off by sort of seeing the the amplitudes and saying oh these are the correlation functions of quantum field theory I know what a quantum field theory is and try to say the quantum field theory Hilbert space then um, that wouldn't necessarily be describing the physics that's natural from the gravitational point of view and then then we had to but, but there's nothing but there's nothing wrong with making these other sorry no. but there's nothing wrong with making these other choices so, so along the way you had many choices and you didn't have to make those that give you a quantum field theory yeah. and and there's nothing wrong with making those other choices not saying that those suffer from other problems that preclude us from pursuing those directions right and in fact i was sort of suggesting that the choices that that seem to me at least that are most natural from the really the gravitational point of view are not the same choices that you would make to build the quantum field theory of the space mm -hmm. and Good. and this is yeah, yeah, yeah this is trying to um you know so this was it's motivated in part by lots of people asking questions like i know one dimensional quantum field theory oh, sorry, i know what about one dimensional quantum gravity it's basically just quantum field theory but quantum field theory has non-commuting observers what's what's going on here and this is trying to sort of flesh out why why we think the yeah. physics is, we're trying to describe is really different here. Um, and is, is that a one line summary? Is that there is no time order ordering of the universes? Um, there is no extra level, it's called time. Yeah, we don't have inherent, yeah. So it's already time maybe, is inside. I mean, it's inside a single universe. It's um, right, therefore, no commutator and so on, and no, you know, contours or back and forth and so on, and nothing. It's just Abidia. It's just nothing. Right. Yeah. It's well, it's saying that there's natural this truth. So let's let's take the, the black hole information problem as a as a context where I've sort of I think I've tried to argue to to this audience and others mm -hmm. that the, the natural way to interpret the gravitational physics is in terms of these sort of super selection sectors, but where where different experiments for black holes that live in different universes or very far apart in, in the same universe uh, are correlated in a particular way, but it's natural when you do those sorts of calculations that there's you're not putting any ordering on it. There's no obvious place where, where such an ordering should come in. Uh, and this is trying to really justify that that, that is a, at least a sensible choice to, um, to describe the physics that we actually. And I think uh, that's the case, particularly this is to use, wormhole is used to, for example, like Z or Z square or Z cube. Those quantity is actually maybe even not real. I mean, it just maybe technological thing to represent uh, a statistical ensemble of like a three-point function, a four-point function, <laughs> then, you know, what's the, what's the order? I mean, concept of order doesn't exist. It's like a fourth moment and fifth moment and a sixth moment. And in that particular way to apply a wormhole, wormhole setup to, to the calculation of the property of the ensemble, then suddenly there's no such structure, so. Right. Yeah. It makes sense, right? Um, yes. But it's, yeah, I mean, so particularly a lot of this is motivated by, by trying to take seriously, like I so said, a lot of these um, kind of calculations concretely happen in, in a Euclidean signature where there's kind of no room to put in time ordering. And yeah, that's it's, another way. Yeah. That's another uh, way to so then there's the question is if you took something like, um, like JT gravity or something more complicated, but you wanted to describe what the uh, these baby universes, if you like, look like in Lorentzian signature and build a Hilbert space out of that. Um, but it's not totally clear sort of what paradigm, if any, that, that yeah. I described today it fits in. But, um, uh, but yeah, we want to make sure we're describing the, the right kind of mm -hmm. physics and that we're, that, the, that we're not blindly following a, following a, um, a, an analogy that's actually leading us yep. in the wrong direction. I agree. Okay. So if you call that like a path of putting a Lorentzian structure and call that as a third quantization of the universe, this baby universe is not that. Um, if you call, it, I mean, it's a name, but if you call third, third quantization as putting, you know, all non commutativity and all like a path back and forth path and so on, like really analogous to quantum field theory, if you define the third quantization as such, then that's baby universe calculation is not that it's totally abelian. You're not putting any order, and it's much yeah, I think so. Yeah, 
yeah this well, is, I'm yeah, just no, when we, when we, said, when we no. do quantum field theory we do yeah we are more structured the, yes. there's yeah that the target space has this you know we, we give the target space this physical significance that has orderings and so forth associated yes, with yes, it because yes, we live yes. in target space whereas target space and gravity here yes. is really something more abstract that's describing yes. shapes and sizes of, of individual universes yes. and yes. Uh, and so we shouldn't we shouldn't push that analogy too hard yeah i'm just taking my own understanding yeah i think that's uh, so we, when you so I, I'm I'm trying to tie this in with your work with 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 your earlier work with Don. Um, so so my I guess my understanding there was that you know we were seeing all these gravity ensemble type dualities like in JT gravity, and um, basically the, the the way that you guys organized this was to see if after the uh, if after you get rid of all the null states, which and you know you, you make you make those various choices, you find out what the Hilbert space looks like, and if it's one dimensional, then I guess you don't have an ensemble, and if it's higher dimensional, uh, you you do, um, and and you've really not. I, I guess that. I guess I have two questions. One is, if if you if you do have an ensemble. Would you would you call this a quantum mechanical theory? I mean, there's some other way of the fact that you construct it in this way make it more palatable as a quantum mechanics. And then secondly, how does this inform your choices? That again, I'm I'm sort of trying to see how you choose the forks in the road when when you when you choose your dagger operator or whatever. Um, yeah. All right. So to the first question what i think the first question was uh, then i go part of the, the point of um what we we're doing with don is to say that this ensemble quantum mechanics is really is just ordinary quantum mechanics it's just what happens when you uh when the you have access to a restricted algebra of observables and you know, this is a uh so yeah this ensemble is really just describing a particular superposition in a state of baby universes, but the observables you have access to, these asymptotic observables, all commute with one another, so you can't interfere different states. You can't tell that if you're not sensitive to relative phases, say, for example. But there is still a quantum mechanics that, um, that underlies it. It's, you know, it's a quantum mechanics with some of the structure stripped out rather than, rather than some something extra on top of quantum mechanics. Um, the second question is, is how you see the forks in the road and how you decide on these. Um, well, yeah, so the, the second question was, was kind of uh, ill-defined, I suppose, but it, um, I, I, I suppose given the answer to the first question, there's no particular you would probably argue that there's no particular reason to try to get the Hilbert space to be small. Yeah. And so no, the, yeah. The, the, guide, the guiding principle in how you would construct the Hilbert space by making these various choices is not to try to get it to be one dimensional. Um, no, I don't. Yeah, it's... Um... Uh, yeah, I, in, in, in these examples, I feel like there was kind of, if you really take the gravitational perspective, there is, is kind of one obvious natural choice that works and gives you something positive and, and gives you a nice interpretation and everything's fine. And if you want to get something else, okay, it's natural from the quantum field theory point of view, but from the, the point of view of the world line where our gravity lives, you're really having to bend over backwards to try to do something mm. a little strange and unnatural. So my expectation is that, you know, like in JT gravity, perhaps there's some other choice you can make that will do a different Hilbert space, but I'd be surprised and it would probably be quite contrived, but... Um,
So the natural choice in the Euclidean case was the one where you just take the, the, the dagger to be the identity. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, yeah, so for JT gravity, it's just these objects Z of beta that involve inserting a boundary of length beta is just Z of beta goes to Z of beta. It's, a, it's the trivial thing. Unless, okay, so, so for example, for this double trumpet thing, you well, Z of beta plus IT is a, is a nice thing to consider for this spectral form factor and so forth. And then Z of beta plus IT adjoint will be Z of beta minus IT. Uh, again, that's, you know, that's the, that's if you, if you start with, um, with the semi-classical picture of the space time and enact a time reversal, that's precisely the, the sort of thing you get. Uh, All right, thanks so much. Any other questions or shall we finally give you a chance uh, to get a break? <laughs> sorry, yeah, I don't, I don't want to keep you much longer, Henry. I just had a quick question. Um, yeah, so do you have anything to say about how we're supposed to understand causality in uh, the gravitational path integral? If it seems like, I mean, usually when we think about causality, it's really in the operator ordering for quantum field theory. And even if you think about say, I don't know, like a naive linearized gravity on some fixed background, you might imagine them some sort of operator ordering that tells you about the like sort of fluctuations in the causal structure. But this this like third quantized picture just seems like there's no causal structure present, but but it seems but it has to emerge somehow, right? As some some sector of it. Do, do you have any thoughts on that? Um Yeah, you don't leave the question is easy. Just, uh, just, no, just, a, just, just nothing, before I go, uh, because I, I, I needed to go. Uh, so just before, you don't need, uh, you don't have any concept of causality in between different universes. That's the point, right? I mean, which universe come first and so on, you don't need to, or you, you don't have a natural choice. So you actually don't have to, or you don't, you, you don't put any of those concepts. In causality in a single universe, of course, then you have to do this QFT way. So you have to, you know, construct some time ordering of the of the B or whatever you know foldings of the of the path integral path right so so that's the way you get the causality in that ap ap application that inside a single universe and beyond that it's just the statistics of ensembles so then you don't have a causal and that's yeah that's so this is choice, exactly part of the point choice. yeah yes the, yeah. the space-time wormholes at first sight look like they violate causality in a horrible yeah. way and but that's part of the emphasizing that the only get classical probability distribution is saying that okay they violate cluster decomposition in a in a in a technical sense but actually um spontaneously broken global symmetries violate for cluster decomposition in exactly the same sense it's, it's only a um yeah it's a limited sense that doesn't affect your ability to do physics but but that that only makes sense if you're if you're living in some asymptotic semi-classical region where you can sort of integrate out wormholes, so to speak. Um, what happens when you're in a deeply quantum gravitational regime, then, well, then perhaps causality just breaks down. But, um, but it, okay, it gets a precise sense in a particular limit where causality, uh, some notion of causality is an emergent thing. But I don't think I have, uh, I don't think I have um, something to, um, in, incisive to say that it's a... okay good question sounds good thanks let me also add that you know we can think about this and discuss more tomorrow because henry is joining us so. yeah i'll, I'll just yeah, i think you. it's gonna be a good yeah a good conversation start yeah anyhow thank so if no more questions let us thank henry again